Casper, Slimer, Bruce Willis in The Sixth Sense. Ghosts appear throughout pop culture and we can generally accept some rules around ghosts. They, can't, they can be seen and heard, but they usually can't interact with physical objects and they definitely can't eat or drink. Welcome to St John's, I'm Andy, our Digital Minister. Well, sorry to burst your bubble, but ghosts aren't real. Their prevalence does go a long way back in human history though. And in today's passage, we see the risen Lord Jesus working to convince his disciples that he isn't a ghost, but a fully resurrected body in the flesh. Before we get started today though, we're hearing from Carol about one of our important local missions, Kids Hope, who pair mentors with primary school kids in need of a positive influence in their lives. Hi Carol, thanks so much for being here. I'd love to ask you some questions about your experience as a Kids Hope mentor. What do you love about being a Kids Hope mentor? I love the fact that you develop a relationship with that one child who's been chosen by the school for a particular reason, to need a mentor. Can you tell us a little bit about what's actually involved in Kids Hope mentoring before and during your sessions? Yeah, for me, we do a lot of cooking, brownies, cookies, what have you. Um, go outside and shoot some baskets. Uh, that She does that. Um, and she has this chat, catch up and talk about how things are going. And then at the end, you have a little report to fill out about what you did and how you felt about it and how your child felt about it. If you could say something to someone who is considering mentoring, what would it be? Um, probably just go for it. It's not difficult, particularly if you've had your own children and been through school years and you kind of know what things they might need help with or um, it doesn't take much out of your day and it gives to someone who really needs something. My name's Maddie. I'm the Generations Minister at St. John's and I'm also one of our Kids Hope mentors and I'll be bringing us the Bible reading today from Luke chapter 24, starting at verse 36. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and the repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are my witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When I was a teenager, a new family moved into the house across the street. They were American. and My brother played with their son and I babysat the kids when the parents wanted a night out. Nothing ordinary, out of the ordinary there. But they had a flagpole in the front yard, which was a bit weird. And the flag wasn't the American flag or the Australian flag. It was a flag I'd never seen back then. It was the Golden Arches. Jerry Grace had been tasked with the job of bringing McDonald's to Australia. And within a few years, he had the first McDonald's store opened in Western Sydney. Now, I don't need to quote the numbers of Macca's stores in Australia today to convince you that he was brilliant at his job. 
just the right man. Jerry Grace is still a bit of a legend in business circles today. In our passage today, we see that Jesus has given the disciples and us a task far more important than convincing the world that they need a Big Mac, far more critical that they get the job done. Well, what is the task? The disciples had witnessed the fulfilment of the, what the whole Old Testament promised and what Jesus had said would happen. He had suffered, died on the cross, and rose from the dead again on the third day. That's what we remember over Easter. Throughout this time, his time on earth, Jesus had preached the message of repentance and forgiveness of sins. Now he was handing over the baton. In that room were, his, were Jesus' followers. He was passing on the job of taking the message of repentance to all believers. They were to start right where they were in Jerusalem until every nation was reached. And Jesus tasked us with the same job, starting where we are in Diamond Creek and taking the message to the whole world. But just look at that lot in the room <clears throat> when Jesus appeared and look at us. None of us are a Jerry Grace. None of us look like the obvious choice to make the most important, take the most important message ever to the whole world. They were frightened, troubled, and full of doubts. So the disciples had two problems, <clears throat> and I think that most of us can relate to them. They struggled with doubts and unbelief especially in understanding the resurrection. And the task was enormous, overwhelming. It's not the job of human beings alone. So let's look at each one of these problems and just how Jesus met the disciples and what that means for us today. Well, firstly, the problem of doubt and unbelief. Now, it's basic marketing. We all know that you've got to believe the message to be able to convince others. Throughout his time on earth, Jesus had been telling the disciples that he would die on the cross and on the third day he would be raised again. But everyone knew that, the dead, that dead people can't make themselves alive. And Jesus was really dead. Those Roman soldiers made sure of it. They were professionals and they knew when their victims were dead. The disciples knew Jesus was dead. They were much more familiar with dead bodies than we are today. So how could they make sense of Jesus' promise to be raised again? Well, all the Jews believed that they would be resurrected on the last day, but not before. So the easiest thing was to believe that Jesus meant that he would be part of the big resurrection at the end of time. But now, what were they seeing in that room back then? How could they explain that? Well, the easiest explanation was to figure that was that the figure of Jesus before them was a ghost. And all of the Jews of the day believed in ghosts. <clears throat> a ghost could just appear like Jesus did. But you couldn't feel anything if you tried to touch them. Your hand might go straight through them. And could you imagine what it would, would happen if a ghost tried to eat or drink something? What a mess. The food and drink would just spill out everywhere. Now, you and I are way too smart to think that Jesus was a ghost. After all, ghosts only appear in comedy movies or come knocking on our door asking for a trick and treat on Halloween. No, ghosts don't exist. So the ghost theory is not helpful for us. We're much more sophisticated than that. But we're not too sophisticated to say that Jesus' spirit reappeared and that he didn't really have a, a real body. See, the problem with believing in Jesus' resurrection is really in understanding what a resurrected body looks like <clears throat> and how it fits in with what we know about dead bodies. So Jesus shows us what a resurrected body looks like. He invited the disciples to do things that you can't do with ghosts. They were told to stare at his body, to see the scars on his feet and hands where the nails were hammered through to put him on the cross. 
And Jesus points out that his resurrected body was really him, not a totally brand new body or someone else. It was the same body they had last seen dead and buried in the tomb. They were told to touch his body. Now you can't feel skin and bones on a ghost, but the disciples could feel that Jesus had a real body. Their hands didn't go through him. He was real. At this point, everyone just got wild with happiness. Jesus was alive, but it was just too good to be true, too hard to believe. So Jesus told them to watch him eat. That fish went down quite well. Jesus had well and truly busted the ghost myth. He also showed us that a resurrected body is fully human. It can be touched. It can eat, it can drink, it can do all the human things. But a resurrected body is not exactly the same as your body and mine. Jesus could appear and reappear, which our bodies can't do. Now that the disciples understood what a resurrected body is like, Jesus reminded them of all that he had said would come true. He also went on to explain all the scriptures about himself. He opened their minds to understand all they had been told and what they were seeing before them. Now they understood what a resurrected body was like and that it was possible they could more easily understand the scriptures that pointed to Jesus. But what about us? How does Jesus help us? Well, we don't need to touch and feel Jesus. There were many credible witnesses who did and who have given a good account of what the resurrected Jesus was like. He didn't get resurrected as a spirit and leave his body behind. There were witnesses to the fact that he did things that a normal human body can do. Jesus appeared on multiple occasions, and in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 6 tells us that there were over 500 people who saw him at one of those times. It was not just a hallucination experienced by a few at one time. There were enough witnesses to confirm what we have learned today about Jesus' resurrection body. And like the disciples, we also have the scriptures. We have the the full Old Testament they had, all of Jesus' sayings while he was on earth, and the letters and sermons of the apostles as well. They all confirm the fact of Jesus' resurrection. Now, it's normal, it's human to have doubts. It is especially hard to avoid doubts when it's about something like resurrection that clashes with what we know about the reality of death. Faith is not about having no doubts. Faith is choosing to believe the truth we know is from God. We can grow that faith and reduce our doubts by spending as much time as we can understanding the scriptures and the truth God tells us. Now, the second big problem the disciples had and and that we have is just the enormity of the task and the nature of the message. It's nothing like promoting a franchise like McDonald's. Bringing a hamburger franchise to Australia was a business decision and required a businessman. But the message of repentance and forgiveness is the plan God has for all of us and requires his intervention. All through the Old Testament, we read that whenever God had a message for his people, he filled someone with the Holy Spirit. So we often see verses like this, Then the Spirit of the Lord came on me, And he told me to say from Ezekiel. In our passage today, in verse 49, Jesus tells the disciples, I'm going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. Now the disciples did wait as told, and Jesus did send the Holy Spirit, who gave them power. It was such a significant event and caused the crowds in Jerusalem at the time to wonder what was happening. And immediately being after being filled with the Spirit, one of the disciples, Peter, got up and preached the message of repentance and forgiveness to the crowds. Now Peter, a fisherman, the most unlikely preacher, 
was doing exactly what Jesus predicted in Luke 24. And about 3,000 people believed his message that day. Now that could only happen with the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has a number of roles, but one very important one is to communicate God's message to us through prophets and preachers, and that still happens today. But Christianity hasn't spread solely because of the preaching of a few individuals through history. The message of repentance and forgiveness has also been shared by ordinary people like you and me. See, the Holy Spirit is given to everyone who believes. Throughout the book of Acts, we see that the Holy Spirit enabled believers to start up prayer meetings, hold church in their homes, and share the message of repentance whenever they move to a new city. It is also the role of the Holy Spirit to help us understand. So we read in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 12, We've not received a spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. It's not only Christians the Holy Spirit helps to understand. As Jesus says in John 16 verse 8, the Holy Spirit will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness. See, the Holy Spirit does not only empower the person sharing the message of repentance and forgiveness, the Holy Spirit also helps the listeners to realise their need for forgiveness. And when they do accept the message, it's the role of the Holy Spirit to transform our lives. In Titus chapter 3, verse 5, we read that Jesus saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. So sharing the message of repentance and forgiveness as Jesus asked us must be infused by the power of the Holy Spirit at every stage all along. The Holy Spirit helps us to understand the message and dispels our doubts. The Holy Spirit gives us power and boldness to speak and then convinces hearers that they need the forgiveness the message speaks of. Only a few Christians got to be eyewitness of Jesus' resurrected body. But as we understand the evidence and the testimony they passed on, all of us are witnesses to Jesus' resurrection and have, with, have the power of the Holy Spirit. A role to, we also have a, share, a role to share the message of repentance and forgiveness to others. See, Jesus knew that he did not need a good business model to take the message of God to all the nations. He knew it was the work of the Holy Spirit. And all we need is the power of the Holy Spirit to get the job done. Like the early disciples, we need to steep ourselves in the scriptures to learn to see how the whole Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament, is all about Jesus. We should ask the Holy Spirit to help us understand. And like the early disciples, we need the power of the Holy Spirit as we share the good news with others starting where we are in Diamond Creek and taking the message to all the nations of the world. So we should also pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to enable us and to work into the lives of people who don't yet know God. There are still a lot of people who don't yet know um, and a lot of nations where there are so few Christians, there is no church to share the message with their neighbours. Let's get involved with what the Holy Spirit is doing in the world. Find out more about what St John's is doing and get involved as you're able. Maybe help out at one of the upcoming art exhibition or TGIF or something, some other activity. Get onto St John's missions blog. Find out what our partners are doing around the world. Find out how you can pray, give and get involved. If you have an interest or a concern for any individual or group, take that as a prompting of the Holy Spirit. Get praying for them and find out how you can be part of getting the good news of Jesus to them. And I'd like to pray for us now. Lord Jesus, we do believe in you. Help us with our doubts and unbelief. We ask for you, your Holy Spirit to give us power and boldness 
and opportunities to speak your message of repentance and forgiveness to the world around us. Amen. It's natural to have some doubts, especially over something as out of the ordinary as resurrection. And it's natural to be worried about a big task being set. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, though, and with trust in Jesus, we can achieve great things. We have an opportunity now to ask the Holy Spirit into our lives, to empower us and fill us with the life that Jesus has won for us and enable us to do good work for him. Let's sing now together, Breathe on Us. My name is Bruce and I'm leading our prayers today. First of all, in silence, let each of us pray for people and situations that are th we are thankful for or that are heavy in our minds and hearts. So let us pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Almighty God, thank you that in Jesus rising from the dead, we see the promise of a world that will be renewed, of a hope that what is wrong will be made right. We thank you that through Jesus living, dying on a cross, and rising from the dead, you renew and restore us by your Spirit to be people who belong to you. Because Jesus has risen from the dead, we pray for our world. Merciful God, we ask that where there is conflict and war, like in Gaza and Ukraine, you will bring peace. We ask that where there is disaster and poverty and hunger and disease, you will heal and restore. Thank you for people who are trying to help. Please give them strength and wisdom. Please give us all a spirit of generosity and compassion. We pray for our country and community. We ask that you would encourage and heal people whose hope has faded. We bring to you people who are in aged care, people who are homeless, in prison, or seeking asylum. God, thank you for leaders who have a vision for a just and compassionate and generous community. Thank you for people who are working to help. Please give us all a spirit of justice and generosity and compassion. We pray for the church and its mission. Merciful God, thank you for all who share your message of forgiveness and hope. We ask that you would help and encourage them. We pray for the people in the other churches in this area. We pray for the staff and volunteers here and for our mission partners. Please guide and strengthen them. Please supply all that they need to do and be what you called them to. Please give us all a spirit of witness and grace. Jesus is risen from the dead. Therefore, we pray for people who are sick and suffering. We pray for people who are forgotten and lonely. We pray for people who do not feel safe. We ask that you would heal and comfort and encourage. We ask that you would guide and support those who are caring and helping. We ask that you would give us all a spirit of listening and compassion. Merciful God, you look with compassion on all who turn to you. Hear the prayers of your people. Grant that what we have asked in faith we may by your grace receive. And we pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thanks, Bruce, for your prayers. So how will you take on the task that Jesus has left for us? What nudge has the Holy Spirit been giving to you recently that you need to follow? Jump onto our website, stjohnsdc.org.au, and at the Info Hub, you'll find a volunteer button. It's got a form with a list of areas in need of support for Jesus' mission in Diamond Creek and beyond. That brings us to the end of our service today. As we finish, let's pray. Gracious Father, who in your great mercy made glad the disciples with the sight of the risen Lord, Give us such awareness of his presence with us that we may be strengthened and sustained by his risen life and serve you continually in righteousness and truth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thanks, everyone. Have a great week. We'll see you again online soon.